Dear members of parliament, excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, dear friends, it really is a true pleasure to be with you here this afternoon. Thank you, Doris, for this um, most kind introduction. I uh, did arrived to Zagreb for a very short time to be with you from the campaign trail. We went to bed at 4 o'clock this morning and we're going back to work tonight until very late. But nevertheless, again, it is a true pleasure to be here with you and thank you very much for being here in Zagreb today to give support to Croatia and to... <laughs> That's why I didn't want to touch it too much. <laughs> and to me personally in the presidential bid because it really is high time that Croatia changes course and uh, gets in the top echelon of the country of the member countries of the European Union and not uh, being at the bottom as we are right now unfortunately however today I am not speaking in my capacity as a presidential candidate but as someone who has been in security, uh, international, and European policy for quite a while, and as someone who has been pushing that glass ceiling upwards for so many times, from being the first uh, female foreign minister to the first female Croatian ambassador to the United States, and now the first, the highest ranking female official at in the North uh, Atlantic Treaty Organization. And now uh, I think time has come for me to push another ceiling to become the first female president of Croatia, but again, we'll put that aside for a moment. However, um, at the beginning of my presentation, in which I will combine my opening remarks with the panel that's ahead of us, and that is the EU policy, the forging of EU policy, I want to pay tribute to another woman who is my hero. When people ask you who your heroes are, you usually think about people who are older of you, your mothers, who certainly is one of my heroes, um, somebody who lived a long time ago in history or maybe a politician or a statesperson. But one of my heroes is a young girl who's about 14 or 15 years now and who was awarded Nobel Peace Prize just today. Her name is Malala Yousafzai. And yes, that's... Who knew that she could be killed for what she was advocating and what she was doing, but nevertheless was courageous enough to stand up to her assassins and to stand up to the whole community and the world and argue and advocate for, the, for women, for girls and women in Pakistan, Afghanistan and, and other parts of the world to get an education. And as a matter of fact, education is a precondition for development of any society, for resolution of any crisis, and it's the strongest weapon against any radical ideology. And that is one of the reasons why Malala is one of my heroes and once again, Congratulations to her, and I hope that uh, she will be very successful in the fight ahead, because what she's done now, or what her intended assassins did, they put a face to the movement for the rights of girls and women to go to school to get an education, and that is their biggest defeat and her biggest victory. So, what has NATO been doing? As you know, the current moment in the security arena is very complex. We just recently had our summit in Wales, and when we started preparing it towards the end of last year, we thought that it was going to be just another summit where we would actually be discussing mostly Afghanistan and closing our operation in Afghanistan. And for the rest of the time, trying to draw the attention of the international community to the fact that security cannot be taken for granted. Well, in the meantime, just in a few short months, we were reminded by several crises or an arc of crises that has developed from the Mediterranean and North African region through Eastern Europe, Russia, Ukraine, towards Central and South Asia, uh, in Afghanistan and elsewhere, that yes, there are still threats that can become so potent, so uh, menacing, and that can develop 
within such a short period of time that we need to be vigilant, we need to remain vigilant, we need to remain connected, we need to remain synchronized, and we need to be ready for action. And thus, NATO took some very important decisions at Wales, including boosting our readiness action force and the so-called spearhead force that would be ready to intervene in a moments of crisis either around the alliance on our territory based on Article 5 or even outside of territories and for which I see, for instance, when um, the Yazidis were trapped on Mount Sinjak that a force like that could come in and have a human humanitarian role as well. But I will not go into the details of the NATO summit and what was concluded. I just would like to focus on what NATO and the European Union can do together and where the European Union, the EU, can build upon uh, what NATO has done and where we need to synchronize our action and act decisively. I will focus on three areas. One is Afghanistan, the second is uh, uh, the so-called Islamic State, please let's not call it Islamic State because they are they're the so-called Islamic State, they are distorting the values of Islam. And the third is Russia-Ukraine crisis and what we can do together in order to reverse the process and to protect the 21st century uh, legal order and order among states. So first, Afghanistan. As you know, we're closing the longest and most complex operation of NATO ever. Uh, that is ISAF operation, International Security Assistance Force, at the end of this year. But we will be continuing with a much smaller force that will not be a combat, but that will be a train assistance and mentor force to the 350,000 strong Afghan National Security Force. We will have to continue to train them, to assist them, to um, build the fund for the sustainment of the Afghan National Security Force and gradually transfer all of those authorities to them. Uh, one of the crucial aspects will be, of course, integrity of that force and combating corruption. And since part of that force is the police function as well, this is where the European Union can come in. I have been traveling to Afghanistan for years now, ever since 2006. I visited many times, not just Kabul. I don't just talk to our troops or to foreigners. I go out in the field, I talk to villagers, village elders, I talk to students, to women, and to many others. And I see hope in Afghanistan. I see that the situation on the ground is so much different than what we had years ago. And that those gains have to be protected. And it's not just the military operation, because there will be security incidents that will continue. There will be areas that unfortunately the Taliban will regain, at least for a little while. But there are other processes that have to continue and that are crucial in taking that country forward where we want it to see it. And that is a stable member of the international community that will not harbor international terrorists any longer, such as Al-Qaeda or even ISIL right now. So, the integrity of the processes in the government, combating corruption, uh, working with institutions for them to become stable are all areas where I see where the European Union can provide assistance. The second area which is very important is the media. I believe that the media is one of the most important integrational factors in Afghanistan. And the media are those who are bringing information in and who are taking information out of Afghanistan. You would not believe it, but one of the strongest weapons of public diplomacy for a long while were soap operas. Soap operas from Turkey and from Bollywood that were digitally uh, a little bit changed in order to adapt it to the Afghan content. But, uh, through those soap operas, people from Afghanistan who had been under such information, isolation, and lack of any education, 
they were able to see that there is a different world out there where women and men can actually talk to each other and where girls and women can go to school.